Very good. Mike Rinaldi and our esteemed panel. Hi, David Reisick uh, from Honor Health in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we're uh, glad to be bringing you a, uh, a uh, Taver case. I am joined by my partner for many years and uh, someone that I thoroughly enjoy working with, uh, Dr. Robert Riley. And uh, for those of you who saw the coronary case today, um, uh, we, we found Herms uh, loitering in the hall. Somehow his plane got yeah. diverted here. So we have uh, Jim Hermiller uh, with us as well. Jim, yeah, thanks. Great, thanks for having great me. Great. This is fantastic. All right. Uh, why don't we get right into it? Why don't we get right into it? Why don't you bring up the slides? Next. 83-year-old uh, gentleman presents with protracted shortness of breath and fatigue, uh, meets the numeric thresholds for severe aortic stenosis and TAVR. He has stage three uh, CKD, baseline GFR is shown there. He has coronary disease. He's had previous PCI, I'll we'll show you that in a minute, several months ago, risk factors for heart disease. He has uh, moderate minus, if you will, just under moderate to severity mitral regurgitation. He's had a permanent pacemaker implant and those are his meds shown. Next. Uh, this is after the PCI in the interest of time, after the PCI of the very proximal LAD. This is the right coronary. We kind of looked at it and thought, do we fix this or do we not fix this? So we FFR'd it and it fell uh, outside the ischemic threshold. Next. Bob Burke, you did some of the vetting on this and the three-man seal. You want to talk about uh, what we have? So what we have here is uh, tri-leaflet valve, so nothing unusual there, no abnormality. Mostly this is leaflet calcium, more at the tips than anything else. Uh, as far as uh, area and perimeter, this fits for a 27 uh, Boston Scientific Lotus Edge. Coronary go heights are great. Go uh, next uh, slide, please. Are great, no issues there. And there's your coronary heights. Okay, great. Next slide, please. We're planning on uh, putting in a Lotus Edge. Uh, this just got to FDA approved several uh, uh, weeks ago. We're pleased to, uh, to be able to do this. We did four last week. The beauty of this, it is repositionable. Uh, you can uh, resheathe it and reposition it. The uh, polycarbonate, polyurethane adaptive seal. I, I think when you talk, Herms, about uh, best in class reduction in uh, paravalvular leak, I think this is it. Would you yeah, agree? No, extremely low uh, paravalvular leak. And, and uh, the you know, deployment's very stable. You know what you got. Braided nitinol frame, bovine pericardium, go next. Now, this shows some of the anatomy. Uh, you hear a lot about the buckles and the post and the sheathing aids. Uh, it, we'll, we'll, we'll show a little bit more on that as we go uh, through uh, the procedure. Uh, go next. Uh, this is deployed by controlled mechanical expansion. The locking mechanism has three sets of buckles and posts. It's the posts that look like the tuning forks and it the commissures of the leaflets are sewn between the legs of the tuning fork and they're radiopaque markers that help you to visualize the locking mechanism. If you could go to the next slide. Now, animation of the locking mechanism, you can see that the valve is locked when the gap between the locking mechanism is gone. Now, this is animation. The next, on the next slide, I show this side by side with one of our deployments. Here you see the locking mechanism closing, buckles and posts coming together. And when you get to the, uh, when the gap is gone, it's locked. So this is what, uh, this is what we uh, plan on doing. Bob Riley, you wanna talk about where we are so far in the case? Now, so far we have uh, right groin access with a 20 French sheath. We have right radio access for our pigtail. We have uh, our root angiogram that we can play here show you our coplanar angle at 9 LAO 15 caudal. Get you that did right play. radial access. Do you avoid uh, contralateral femoral access now? Because I think that's kind of a yes. concept. Yeah, we've, we've been doing right radial access for the pigtail. It works. Sometimes it will get inter intertwined uh, on the device, but generally it works pretty well. So here's our... What do you uh, think? How many other people are doing that? Because that... that could reduce your femoral complications and a lot of times your femoral complications. <laughs> yeah. Well, well why don't you discuss... The femoral complications occur on the contralateral side. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. Most of our femoral complications have actually truly been the contralateral side. So we, we um, occasionally have to pull the pigtail back up and, and redirect, redirect yeah. it. But 
other than that, it's pretty stable for us. We did some hemodynamic monitoring for you that we have on a slide. Go, to go to the, bring the slides up and go to the next slide, please. Can you? I would just comment that the locking me mechanism now is so easy to see. Oh man. Different you, from first generation. And, yes. and you don't have to go into multiple planes to see it. There's some of the hemodynamics that, uh, that we performed beforehand. Uh, so we're next. gonna work. So we uh, crossed the valve here with uh, uh, straight wire and then exchanged it for a pigtail to measure our hemodynamics. And here we have the extra small uh, safari wire which turns out to be about the same size as the confita wire, or confita, depending on your accent. Yes. Yeah, okay, I got Can you pedal. comment on your valve choice in this situation? Uh, why Lotus? Yeah. I think we could have used several uh, different valves in this particular case. I think uh, there was no one right answer. Uh, Herms, you looked at, uh, we, you and I vetted this uh, together. Uh, what, what, tell me uh, what you might have done uh, similarly or different in terms of valve choice. I think it's, if it's dealer's choice, you could use what you want on this particular case. I think uh, all three of the valves we have approved would do well, well here. So we decided to do a, a pre-dilatation here with an 18 true balloon. How, how many people on the panel, Kendra, you and I discussed this at SIF a few weeks ago uh, at great length. How many people pre-dill? How many people never pre-dill? How many people are 50-50? Be interested in hearing from the panel uh, what, what the thoughts are on uh, balloon valvuloplasty. We, we tend to pre-dilate almost all, all valves, especially if they're heavily calcified. It's clear that we don't uh, pre-dilate. Can I have a sloppy wet? We tend to pre-dilate almost none of the valves. Um, <laughs> and kind of we go with uh, what Kendra said in our last case, and that is if lap. we see the wire fall into a good position um, down into the non-corner uh, cusp, then, then that gives me a good idea that I think the, the valve will usually cross fairly easily. If it doesn't um, fall into that position or if it looks like it's more right. fixed in place, then we'll consider pre-dialing. Sure, seem ready to pace. Michael Reardon once, I asked Michael Reardon once, floor save that, I asked Michael Reardon once, do you pre-deal or not? He says, I pre-deal 100% because my cardiologist wants to. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's all over the uh, map in terms of whether you pre-deal or not. We're gonna uh, do a valvuloplasty now. Could you bring down the lungs and... Uh, what, what, what size is this, uh, 18. 18? Yeah. Pacer on. Face off. Off. So as we're taking the balloon out, we did debate it, uh, whether or not to pre-dilate this valve. The uh, Lotus valve does such a great mechanical valvuloplasty and it's so easy to recapture Boy, and reposition no that uh, you can do it without pacing. Uh, I, I think that's a really important point is the, the capability of the, uh, of the Lotus to do a mechanical valvuloplasty. Bob, did we do anything meaningful to this? It looks like it opens up a little bit better here. We've got a little bit more ability on the uh, non and the right. Uh, we don't have any significant aortic insufficiency, so this looks good. Could you show, while we uh, load the Lotus valve, the uh, why don't we show the S shape. When we, uh, can you zoom in on the table, please? So the way this, mm. on the right access side, we try and have this form an S shape. Uh, to, uh, to, to go in. If we were doing on the left side, it'd be the opposite. It'd be a two shape. But when you uh, deploy it on the right side, you try and do an S shape. And we're gonna talk through some of the things we look uh, at as we're uh, deploying this. Um, while we're putting this up, could you put up the, uh, the slide number uh, 12 or 13? This is from the RESPOND trial, 1,000 patients post-market surveillance in Europe. And you can see whether you uh, did balloon valvuloplasty or not, there's sort of equipoise uh, in this uh, in terms of outcome data. Uh, you can come back live. So, so we, we have a little bit more of a gap here, so can you close that up a little bit? After you load this device onto the wire, you have to check to make sure that you're sheathed properly. You uh, like that? You can get a lot of, uh, another half twist. Okay. You get a lot of stored energy in this valve system, delivery system, so after you, uh, 
close or, or open up the device, you have to let it catch up. And now we have about a fingernail. Take a fingernail. Between the nose, nose right. cone and the catheter. Perfect. Okay, go live. Right. Here we go. And we're live. And we got the, the wire. Yeah. And Dave, how relaxed are you when you place this valve compared to your other valve? Um, so, okay, I'm, I don't want to jinx myself, so I'll tell you afterwards, okay? Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> so let's, let's go full field on mag here. There you go. So as we get into the descending aorta, we want that little Straighten bright marker out. here. So many people in the audience are obviously not familiar with the deployment of this uh, valve because it just was introduced to the U.S. market. What size sheath again? Is it 50? 20 French sheath. This is 20. And you, Bob, why don't you describe the marker yeah. and what you're doing with your movements as you go so up let's go with a little that. counterclockwise as we okay. pull back to Marshall. Okay. So you can see the marker in the mid-valve, the bright marker, radio opaque marker here. As we advance up the descending and, and arch, we want to rotate the valve so that that's on the greater curve. And you have to do that while you're moving. So we'll start here and go ahead and rotate the handle, David. Beautiful. And pull the probe back, T probe back. There on the greater that curve. That looks good. Now that looks really nice. So what Bob did beautifully, uh, very skilled, is while he was advancing that, he, uh, go ahead and mag up and give me a little more fluoro. He, got that to lay on the greater curvature. Give me a little bit more floral and pull your baffles out. Good, perfect. Come to our implant angle now. Now here's where we have to get a little concerned about catching on our pigtail. Occasionally it happens, but right. uh, usually a little bit more with the core valve than here. So let's check our pigtail position. Give me a toot. Pigtail looks good. Mag up one. Bob, we're gonna ask you to come back a little bit, just a little bit. Perfect, thank you. So 915, there you go. I like that better okay. with our. Okay, so, so far, very relaxed. Uh, so Bob, I'll let you talk through, uh, Bob and I take turns sort of talking through or uh, being the, uh, the in uh, lab proctor uh, and Herms, uh, yeah. you as well. Why don't you talk through how deep you wanna be here and what our goal of the implant is. So first of all, uh, we just want the nose cone across the native annulus here. I will mention that it, despite the uh, usage of the confita wire and safari for core valve, it does absolutely nothing for the uh, lotus valve here. So we want to start, and in this case, we're going to go a little bit deeper than usual. So we're going to start unsheathing with the nose cone just into the ventricle, and then we're going to allow the valve to come ventricular about 10 millimeters before we start uh, deploying. Our normal goal is eight, but because of some of the anatomic differences on this valve, we want to start a little bit lower, and we're not that worried about the uh, pacemaker since he already has one. And our mark is still good out there. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so and if you look at my hands, I've, I've come and zoom in. So the first deployment movement, Bob, I'm going to start deploying if that's okay with you, yeah. is a counterclockwise movement rolling toward me, and Bob is uh, very carefully controlling uh, the depth and what you have to do as you're unrolling this, Bob has to go in and out. So I can't hold this too tightly uh, between uh, counterclockwise movements. Some people uh, will you know, just kind of say, I'm clicking, I'm rolling, I'm moving. Uh, Bob and I have done this enough times that uh, I think we have a feel for each other's uh, movements. So stop right there. And we're about six or seven right there. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we, far this looks an awful lot like core valve deployment. Would you say it's very similar, or are there ways that I, you can contrast? But, uh, Herms, why didn't you Yeah, no, I think it? it's a very good analogy. I think, uh, um, and both are slow, Go ahead. Okay. right? Take your time. There's no reason to rush this. And uh, so in that sense, Center it the is. wire a little bit, please. So now we wanted to go deep, so I'm allowing it to go deep. Now I'm going to start pulling it back a little bit. So with the depth guard, now the bottom doesn't contract that much. It's mostly just a topwards down unraveling. And that's an important point that depth guard is going to help control the depth of expansion. Now we see our three tuning forks. And I'm pulling a little bit of backward tension. And you got a little backward tension, okay. And those tuning forks, I love your position right now, Bob. Your position looks really, really good. A little contrast too. And you said you were holding backward tension. Is there some... Uh propensity to dive into the ventricle, is that what you're counteracting or what, why would you do that? Counteracting that on this one in particular because we wanted to start deep and pull back as opposed to the normal deployment where we would have started at eight and the normal 
braiding would have pulled us up to about four. Bob, I like our braid density. Yeah. Uh, you look at braid density at the bottom. I like our braid density. This is looking pretty nice. And now what we're going to see are the tuning forks coming up. Now I'm going to push it over a little bit. Okay, you're going to yeah. roll over. We got contact. Now you can see a little indentation. And by the way, the so valve is working contact. already. And the difference between this and core valve, good point, Bob, is that you do not go through that uh, uh, phase where the valve isn't functioning. I like that. Pull the TE Pro back a little bit. So TE Pro see. back, please. Yep. Herms, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think... Uh, now, gonna what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a Cine, just so you can see. You see the buckles and posts, and you can see all three of them. And unlike Lotus Classic, we're not rolling from side to side to see the buckles and posts come together. But rather, I like our depth. And mag up one more, please. Yeah, mag up one more. Can you come back with the TE probe uh, yep. a little bit more, please? There. That's great. That's perfect. Thanks. Now where you can see the buckles and posts are very close together. I like the way the frame looks. I like the frame density. Now you have to be a little careful here because once it locks, they open back up again. So you just need to see them touch. And here you can see, and I think we're at lock on at least two of the three. I'm giving back a lot. You're giving time. me back a little bit? So while we're here, I'm gonna do a little push-pull to make sure that valve does not move. Going to off and save that. Okay. You gave quite a push there. Yeah. That looks nice. Bob yeah. Burke, do you mind taking a look at this and seeing what we have? So now this is a fully functional valve. Pressure is 90. Hemodynamics look great. And tell us what you're seeing, Bob. So we got a short axis on the left and long axis view on the right. I like the depth. This is looking great. We're really not yeah. seeing any paravalvular leak. So to be sure we could take the parallax out of our so tuning forks. So do me a favor. Uh, go a little bit LAO for me. A little bit LAO. Perfect, right there. That's perfect. So now we have the tuning forks all yeah, on the same good. plane. Do you like that, Yeah, no, they, they look very good. So I'll take a little picture and save that. And I think they're all locked. Uh, Bob, would you agree that they're all locked, that yes. the gap between the buckle and the post is gone? The thing you see on top is not the buckle and post, but it's the collar on top of the buckle post mechanism. Yeah. So now we want to go to the, the lock. The Bob, clip, I'm, the I'm, I'd like to, I might as well, I think we ought to just deploy this thing. What do you think? Bob Burke? This looks perfect. Okay. So and now our coronaries were very high. We don't have to worry about are that. Coronaries are very high. The sinuses are good. Big or no? That's your left main the right there. And you can see we've got a lot of space. You can see the bifurcation actually right here. Turn and inject it. That's your left main, right. and then you have bifurcation right back through there. Now zoom in on my hands if you can, please. All right, now I'm going to take this to what's called a hard stop. Still counterclockwise movement toward me, and that looks really nice. It looks like we're in good shape, good depth, and now I'm at hard stop. Now the next thing we do... And the valve is still fully recapturable at this point. At this time. point, we can pull the whole thing back in. Okay, so now I'm going to move the collar forward. Can you see this collar? I'm going to move, Bob, hold that good and tight. All right, and now we're going to advance. You're going to see the release pin. See that release yep. pin moving up? Yep. Right in the middle. Okay, good. There, okay. All right, should we finish this off? Have you gone to the line? Now, let me get to the line, and there. Now the release pin is up. Everything is locked nicely. Yeah. TEE, I mean, it hadn't moved at all. Yeah. No, this looks it looked perfect. like the pins came off. One yeah, the, we, the sheathing they... aids came off, yep. So now we'll... you want to just try and release the sheathing aids, mm -hmm. Bob, carefully. Just a little, and there it is. Bob Burke, take another look. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the sheathing aids. Not yet. Let me get the pigtail out of it. Okay. Here Got a little bit of wire 
associated AI, but that's about the extent of it right now. Okay, let me close this up, Bob. There you go. So those sheathing aids, the tips are very flexible. They're not that they're not dangerous to poke through the aorta, but you want to keep it off the valve. And you definitely want to close close back up. So we have sheathing aids, aids now resheathed, and our next step here is going to be it's we've all got central. the wire. It's cool. all central. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's pull the keep going. Close it up. Pull it out in the ascending. Okay. We'll close the nose yeah. cone and the uh, wire out of the ventricle simultaneously. And so with core valve, there are tricks to try to keep the nose cone from grabbing the valve and pulling it out. Is there anything analogous here that you're looking for? Or Not that we have seen. Herms, have you seen anything? No. We haven't seen that at all. I, you know, I, I, this looks really spectacular. Bob, are you happy with the look? No, this looks great. Bill, you happy with the look? Good. You know, you pull the wire out, as you see, and then it's very floppy in there. So I, I think the... Uh, Not up too far. Okay. Issues are not as great, maybe, with this uh, compared to the core valve. Can I come out? So yep. Beautiful valve deployment. What do, where will you see this fitting into your practice now that we have three valves? I think that's a huge question. <sighs> yeah. Well, so I think that this valve uh, virtually eliminates paravalvular leak. So I think that the heavy, especially the eccentric calcified valve, this would be a, a go-to valve. Any valve that you're worried about that you might have to reposition more than once, this is a good valve. Any patient that you don't want to pace, uh, you can as long as you can get across the valve with the nose cone here, you can do a mechanical valvuloplasty without any pacing. So I think those are three pretty solid reasons to use this valve. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Mike, uh, to extend on that question is, how many valves do you need in your lab now, right? Do you need three valves today that we have three approved? What, what, what does everybody on the panel think? I think it's a, you know interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I think for, uh, I'm interested to hear the rest of the panel, but um, it depends on how many, how many cases you do, uh, because you really need to be proficient with at least one valve and, and then have the volume to support sequential valves. So what is the right number? Let's hear from the panel. Yeah, I, I, if you're a low volume center, you better be good at transfemoral one valve. If you're only doing 20 valves a year, you shouldn't try and use three and do all these fancy things to get comfortable with one. If you're doing two, three, four hundred, you should be able to do all the valves, I think, yeah. because you need to be a center that can handle specific cases for specific reasons. Um, but if you're a low volume center, I would be good at one thing and know when you should send it to somebody else. Can I make a point about this valve and this deployment? Now we've done... We were a large enrolling center in the clinical trial, and I was honored to have been the co-principal investigator of this of Reprise 3 with Michael Reardon. Uh, it, this, and so I, I want to temper my comments so that, uh, and understand that I am conflicted as the co-PI of the trial. This is a drama-free, most instances, this is a drama-free deployment, and is, and Core valve is a great valve. Her, uh, S3 is a great valve. This is as drama-free as it gets. This is as much melodrama as we see during these. I'd, I'd like to, uh, maybe we'll get uh, somebody juggling or uh, dancing clowns in the background to spice up the room. This really is an easy valve to deploy, drama-free. The data on redeployments is spectacular. There are fewer redeployments. When you do have to redeploy, Again, it's very easy and very simple to do. You saw us do a valvuloplasty. You saw us get wire across, do a valvuloplasty, and deploy the valve. And uh, it's, we started the case at 2.15 and it's 2.38 our time. It, it, it tells you the simplicity and ease of use. For me, the most important thing when I started using this valve was the paravalvular leak. Uh, the amelioration of paravalvular leak. I, you, where does that rank on your priority scale? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's obviously very important. Uh, fortunately, every, all the platforms have gotten better, but this probably uh, has the lowest rate or uh, equal to the lowest rate. Um, we didn't talk about it, but in addition to the heavy calcification, somebody that you want to pace, there's great bicuspid disease uh, data, right? And w w this can be used very nicely by cuspid. And, and I love at the end of it, you know where you're at. There's, there's no jumping around. There's no jumping around. The other thing was, you know, the pacemaker rates. People always talk to me about, you know, address the pacemaker rates. About halfway through Reprise 3, Bob and I and Bob Burke made the decision to implant higher. And it was heresy at the time. Uh, 
people didn't believe in the high implant, but in the second half of our trial, our pacemaker rate in our lotus arm uh, was about 11%. Uh, compared to a somewhat higher rate overall in the study. So you can implant this high very easily. You get, you get a mulligan, you get multiple shots at implanting it high. Um, and if you don't like your first deployment, uh, you, 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 you get to try it again until you, you get the high deployment you want. Coronary access, as long as you have decent sinus volume. Uh, is is generally not an issue. Yeah, and, and yeah, with respect to the coronary access, as long as um, you know you've got a decent sinus, or you're below the coronaries with it, you've got no issues. Right, right. right. It's easy to get into. So one one uh, aesthetic point about this valve is that the you you mentioned it at the beginning that the valve is suspended to the tuning forks here. It's not suspended to that braided frame. Right. So that right. frame can look nice, or it can look bunched up, and the valve still work well inside of that. Can you go to slide number uh, seven on my presentation, please? So while we're waiting, I'd like to ask, go next. Um, I actually don't implant TAVR. I do surgical AVRs. It sounds like we have the perfect valve for TAVR. Now we have to look at the patients. And I have a hard time thinking that all of these can be done in the uh, cath lab. I mean, the aortic stenosis patients, low flow, low gradient, low EF, um, that's a high-risk patient population, and I know that we've had chest compressions going on in our hybrid OR. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it seems like we're playing with fire if we do all of our TAVRs. I'm sure the volume discussion is relevant here. And they weren't doing CPR on the surgeon, right? <laughs> <laughs> What Bob was referring to, Bob uh, Riley was referring to, if you look, go, go put that slide back up, please. You see that the, uh, the commissures of the leaflets, if you look at the left image, the commissures of the leaflets are sewn between the legs of the forks. That's the point you were making. Um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, we get early functioning of the valve, and there's no hypotensive phase to speak of. And you can have a great big chunk of calcium that distorts the, the braided frame that does not distort the valve right, at all. Exactly. So let me ask a question. Um, you know, beautiful valve, it's great. We have a new valve available to us uh, that may really have advantages in certain situations and may also be a good workhorse valve. But um, as you'd mentioned, there's always an issue of pacemakers with all valves. So let's say you have a right bundle branch block. How are you managing those patients? Do you put a temporary pacing lead in the neck and send them to the ICU? Uh, does your floor allow a temporary pacing lead? Do you put in a biotrace pacer, and can you put those at the floor? Do you do a screw-in lead? Uh, we're still struggling with this. We still send ours to the ICU, but, but man, that's not the future. I would be curious to hear what the panel has to say. Maybe we could go from left to right on the panel. How do people uh, manage that? that that's, that's a really tough one. How do people manage that? So I would say we end up... Um, just using the groin pacer, and then we will place a pacer, a temporary pacer, in the neck if we notice that there are concussion disturbances at the end of the case. Um, where I trained, actually at Duke, we often use screw-in pacing leads um, prior to the case with our high-risk patients so that we wouldn't have to do that after the case. But, you know, we found that with higher deployment, uh, more shallow deployment of the core valve, and certainly with the Sapien S3, that here. rates uh, or need for pacemakers fairly low. We, we, we certainly put a rod IJ sheath in, put a pacer into the neck, and we do our cases on Mondays and Fridays, and we try and put our right motor branch block patients on Monday. It's easier to get a pacer that, that day or, or Tuesday if we need to. So you're saying you actually have the EP guy, people do it same day rather than wait till the next day? Yeah, um, yeah so if we go with the right bone and we come out with complete heart block, we would not feel comfortable sending that patient home so we would put a pacer in them and, and eat it if we have to. Yeah. Herms, what do you do? What do you do with the, with the patient who has a new uh, interventricular conduction delay? Say it's now 140 milliseconds, and, uh, and you're trying to, yeah, first of all, do you put all your pacers in through the neck or through we, the We put them in through the leg. Um, if a uh, high-risk case the afterwards at the new bundle or, um, or even some heart block during the procedure, then they get in the neck just because we want to be able to ambulate them. And then, uh, you know, the patients that do get complete heart block uh, uh, during the case or at some point they get okay. a permanent pacemaker. Uh, for us, they can just go to the floor, all the, all the 
uh, beds are sort of indistinguishable. You know, and somebody that's a right bundle that's coming in, um, I'm not sure that I w I'd probably pick an S3. Probably that's got the lowest uh, uh, pacemaker rates um, and put it in real high. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we're getting down a lot of subtleties trying to pick between the valves, but that may be one uh, decision point. Anybody use the BioTrace pacer, and is that a, a useful surrogate to screw in? I'm trying to convince my AP guys that it might work. Mm -hmm. You, you know, we, we, yeah, we've had some experience with it, and it is, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little device. I think it is safer than the screw-in lead, um, and it is uh, very stable. So we still have some time. Um, uh, um, just um, a comment, not, not a comment, tribute actually to the uh, person who uh, designed the uh, Lotus valve. Probably, um, I don't know if uh, many of you know this. So this goes back to 2003. <laughs> Don Beam yeah. and uh, Amr Salahia, the engineer, uh -huh. they started the company in, uh, in California. And actually, it was uh, one of the people who was involved with this. And, and a surgeon, female surgeon, I think Jennifer White, her name. I don't know if she is uh, around here. And they were the first people who designed this valve. So we need to give tribute to Don Beam, who came up with the design with Amr Salahia, the engineer, to develop this valve. Yeah, brilliant man. I trained under him, and uh, it was a terrible passing. So, yeah. so um, gradients. What do you think about this valve and gradients? Uh, Bob, you know, Bob people Burke. pick core valve for yeah. its gradients. What do you think about this? Bob Burke, you have done a tremendous amount of work on looking at the hemodynamics uh, after the three uh, valves, uh, three different types of valves that we have have been implanted. Do you want to talk about what your uh, work has shown in terms of hemodynamics? So hemodynamics, again, our hemodynamics with this tend to run a little bit on the higher side. Still mostly single digits, but occasionally uh, low double digits, uh, 10s to 13s. Part of this is actually reflected by the fact that you have smaller valve sizes and we don't have a comp uh, comparator really to a 29 or a 34 uh, with an S3 or an Evolute series. So we can't entirely uh, compare this across the board. But the hemodynamics tend to run a little bit higher. What I will say, though, is watching these over the years from Reprise 3, since we do all of our own follow-up, the hemodynamics tend to be very stable. So we haven't had issues with progression, uh, even with these uh, numbers maybe being one or two points higher uh, than some of the others. Do you, um, do you guys think that those numbers, you know, the, we even saw this in uh, Partner 3 versus Corval Low Risk. You can't do the power transitivity and compare them, but... But, you know, a one millimeter mercury difference between surgery and P3, a couple millimeters between surgery and Corvelt, are those important numbers? Yeah, so I'll take a shot at that, Mike. I think, first of all, if we look at the clinical data, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we have the clinical data. I think the other um, fact, and the group at Beaumont, uh, I think, uh, had some very nice data about this is, you know, the modified Bernoulli and the way we calculate gradients with echo really is designed for high pressure gradients not low pressure normally functioning valves. And so with pressure recovery and so forth, I think there's probably less difference in these valves than we see necessarily with uh, what we, uh, you know, uh, estimate echocardiographically. Uh, what I would say is that with the really small valves, like a 23, uh, we do have issues with higher gradients across the board. And at least from TVT registry data, it does appear that there is a concern for patient prosthesis mismatch and higher rates of CHF hospitalizations and possibly even increased mortality with very small valves when there's PPM. Yeah, but it's very interesting. If you look at the PPM data with TAVR versus surgery, it's much different. I mean, the hazard ratios for severe PPM with surgery, um, you know, they're very high. Uh, the hazard ratio for, you know, Howie's paper and the, the TVT registry, you know, those hazard ratios are not uh, certainly anywhere as high as we see with uh, surgical PPM, probably in part because, you know, surgical PPM, we know exactly what that surgical valve area is. You have it on the bench top. And whereas with TAVR, it's uh, something that we estimate with echocardiographic. So then I'm going to push you a little bit. So a 420 annulus, um, uh, going to put in a core valve, going to put in a, uh, uh, this valve today, or are you going to put in an S3 Lotus? What, what are you going to put in? Does it matter? I'm not sure it matters. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think that's a, I think that's a wash. I'm not sure that matters. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, 420, I'm, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not convinced on the clinical data. Bob Riley, 420. As long as they're a surgical candidate, they can, they can still have a root replacement. Or a root <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does it matter how big the patient is? Does it matter if it's a man or a Definitely. woman? Does it matter? Yeah, Howie, that's good. Is that Howie? That's uh, a great point. Bob? All right, so great. And so what, what was your closure technique on the, on the groin here? Oh, we uh, did a per-close and pre-close fashion. Uh, and, uh, Single we, one. Yeah, uh, no, we used to. We used to. I hear a lot of uh, stories about people saying they use one and they never look. We use two and we do look. Uh, Except for today. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, and it looks like it's, uh, we, we in good shape over there guys with the groin? Great, yeah. fantastic. We've uh, got another 10 minutes so you could put another patient on the table if you want. We could do, do another, another tabber. We could do another tabber. At this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to express my gratitude first to okay. Jim Hermiller for uh, being gracious enough to come it's here and the guide us through this. It's yeah. always it's terrific uh, uh, having Herms in the lab. Uh, I don't know if you realize you have privileges and <laughs> malpractice insurance no, and I'm, everything. I'm here just now. moonlight. You're I'm just moonlight. moonlight, yeah. You're on call tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank my friend and partner, uh, Bob Riley, yeah. who just has mm -hmm. taught us so much about uh, valve pathology and valve treatment and valve disease. Bob, it's been a godsend uh, working with you these past eight years. It seems like we're together four times a week talking about mitrals and aortics and the, the next generation of this and that. And uh, you, you've just done a spectacular job, so thank you very much. Thanks, it's been great working with you. And you know, just for the record, I didn't bring up any controversy about uh, pre-dilatation. No, you didn't, you didn't. And then uh, finally, uh, our other partner, uh, Bob Burke, who uh, all of the, so much of the vetting of these cases, uh, Bob uh, Burke is responsible for. We made this look easy and simple, but we've been uh, working on this case here for the past several weeks, making sure everything was right uh, with, uh, uh, with this case. So. Uh, I think we'll uh, sign off now. Great case. The take-home message is uh, get experience with this valve. It is a spectacular valve and, uh, as I said before, a drama-free uh, implantation. Did you say Dave, thanks ingredients? very much. It's been an honor to moderate this honor health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what was our mean gradient? It was six. Our mean gradient was six. Great. There we go. Oh, one, great case. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. <laughs>